I felt like a piece of dirt. Stray dogs in the street get more respect than we do. At least somebody will throw them some food or something. We don't get that. It's not only that they're homeless, but it might be a mental health issue. It might be that they've been severely abused emotionally, physically, or sexually. They use drugs that keep them up at night so that they don't have to find a place to sleep, or they use drugs that keep them from wanting to eat because they can't find food. And they click into that survival mode and they're like, I don't have the means, I don't have a car, I don't, you know, I barely have the money, you know, I'm gonna do what I have to do in order to make it to tomorrow. You don't walk down the street one day and, whoa, I stepped in a puddle of homelessness. It just doesn't happen like that. Us as kids, we need to start by helping ourselves out and stop acting like we're hoodlums and start acting like we're actually humans. If you've ever driven through downtown Springfield, chances are you've come across a few homeless teenagers along the way. They don't wear signs that identify them, but they're here, every day and every night, doing what it takes to get by. On this edition of HTV Magazine, we look deeper into the problems faced by teens living on the streets of a town like ours, here in the nation's heartland. We admit up front there are no easy answers, and there is no reason to think this problem is going away anytime soon. But you can't deal with a problem until you admit you have one. Here's Savannah Steffen. It's a medium-sized city with a small-town feel. According to the most recent census, about 160,000 people live in Springfield, Missouri. A Tennessee homesteader named John Polk Campbell founded the town in 1829, but it wasn't named Springfield until six years later. The Frisco Railroad helped build the town in the mid-1800s. These days, Springfield is known for its medical mile, and the two largest employers here are hospitals. There are several public and private colleges, five public high schools, and over 175 churches. This is also the birthplace of the Mother Road, Route 66, and if you look closely, you can still see remnants of the famous highway here and there. The city is not very diverse, 88% of us are white, and most of us are Protestant. People generally feel safe here, and we enjoy our recreation, with over 90 parks to prove it. But even in a quiet, small city like this, there are social problems that must be faced. One of those is the issue of homelessness among local youth. It's a big enough problem that a study has been done in 2007, 2009, and most recently in 2012. Connecting the Dots was an extensive survey of Springfield's high-risk and homeless youth. The findings are helping guide a number of efforts to battle the problem. Todd Duncan is a chairperson of the city's Homeless Youth Subcommittee. He oversaw the 2012 survey, which tried to figure out what causes teens to end up on the streets to begin with. Uh, we have a lot of myths and stereotypes about youth in general and homeless youth in particular, um, but this youth just didn't want to follow the rules or they just didn't want to go to school. And, um, you know, really the top three reasons that the youth reported that they'd been homeless on their own, that there have been a lot of, lots of arguments in the home, um, that they've been kicked out by the family, and that there also had been a lot of verbal abuse. Those were really the top three reasons. Uh, the next reason was, uh, you know, I didn't want to follow the rules. Uh, that was in there. And something else was in there, a sobering number. 44% of over 500 high-risk teens surveyed had been or were currently homeless. Teens at 20 different facilities were questioned for the study. Some of them said it wasn't just verbal abuse or arguments that led to them hitting the streets. Brittany Gosshorn, a social work major from Evangel University, worked at a local youth outreach center where she heard stories from homeless kids every day about how they got where they are. There were a lot of kids who had been, you know, in state custody as a foster child or in residential treatment that had aged out of the system and they're coming in and they really don't have anywhere to go. Other factors that are often associated with adult homelessness also play a role with youth, as Brittany discovered in those conversations. Kids who had, you know, a background of mental illness in their families and from themselves, like backgrounds of violence, um, traumatic events that may have happened, like when they were younger, that just a series of unfortunate happenings that brought them to where they are. The outreach center Brittany worked at plays a crucial role in the story of homeless teens here in Springfield. It's called The Rare Breed, and it provides youth a place to go from 3 to 11 p.m. on weekdays. It's been a lifeline for teens since it opened its doors in 2000. Erin Washburn is the supervisor of the street outreach program. We provide the youth a place to get off the streets and get the services they need, so they can come in. If they're homeless, they can get shelter. Really provide them with a sense of family and well-being and 
be able to build relationships with them so that they trust the staff and can come to us with any kind of issues that they're facing while they're in a homeless situation. Brooke Shelby is a 21-year-old youth worker at the Rare Breed, where she has to be prepared for just about anything. A day at our job is a day where you could be, in one day, a teacher, a doctor, a mom, and a counselor. Um, but you get to talk to youth who have really been thrown away by the rest of society, youth who they don't care about anymore or they don't want to have to deal with um, and are being ignored. And so we get to spend our day looking into the lives of those youth and really um, just figuring out who they are, why they are the way they are, and what it is they need. Those needs often start with the simple things. It's a good place to come shower, get food, snack, relax, get away from the world. The world turned upside down for Trey Edward a couple of years ago after he had just moved to Springfield to meet and move in with his biological mother. She had a little one bedroom apartment. Everything was going okay. Then she left, went out of town, got back on drugs after 11 years of sobriety. And just like immediately, it just went downhill. Like two days, I went from having a job interview, having a place to stay, to out on the streets with the clothes on my back and no chance of getting that job. So in a matter of 48 hours, Trey went from living in his mother's home to surviving on the streets. I've had to walk around, pick up cans off the ground, do scrapping. I've had to, sometimes I've broken into a few places, had to get food and money. Not proud of the things I've had to do, but it works. I've gone to Commercial Street, do small favors for different random strangers that I've never met for like four or five dollars here and there. If they don't want to walk to Price Cutter, I've got two feet in a heartbeat, I can do it for them. It took Trey over a year to find a job, but he finally has one. He still has no permanent home and is sleeping wherever he can. His story is not unique. We didn't have to look any further than the hallways of our own school to find Dalton Locke, a teen facing a similar situation. How long have you been homeless? How long has that been? I've been homeless for about three months now, and I under it hits close to home because I understand that it's nobody's fault. It's just what happened. There were things that nobody could help, but I still have that feeling that there's something I could have done to help everyone out. So we all feel that, but we know it's not true. Dalton's homeless journey begins with a fire that destroyed the home he and his mother lived in. An older sister gave them a temporary home until Dalton and his mom got a place of their own. Shortly after they settled in, his mom was hospitalized, told she could no longer work, and once again, Dalton was back on the street. He found a shelter with a family friend who traded Dalton a place to crash as long as he would babysit at night. That arrangement eventually ended, and he found out his mom and sister were moving to a new place, a small town 70 miles away. He made the decision to stay in Springfield to finish his senior year, no matter how difficult that would turn out to be. I don't want to transfer schools and I don't want to go through all that process. So I was just staying around here wherever I could, sleeping on friends' couches, sleeping pretty much anywhere that I could so I didn't have to move out of here because this school has helped me so much in the past. Uh, after my fire, they helped me with food, getting into my new new place, they helped us get furniture, they they helped us a lot, so I really didn't want to just leave here. Hillcrest High School has other students like Dalton in need of assistance. Some are homeless and others seem headed that way. The school is the poorest of the city's five public high schools, with two-thirds of its student body on free or reduced lunch. So the school started a food pantry and clothing bank just for Hillcrest students and families. Melissa Allen is the school's coordinator of interventions. When you ask her what is needed the most, she admits it's more money, but something else is also worth a lot. Compassion, you know, somebody who's willing to step up and even if they can't give money, give time and help um, with these students because they just need somebody who can listen and cares and wants to help. It's hard to overstate the importance of the rare breed to the city's homeless youth. It's a place that specializes in listening and helping. It's where teens on the street find warmth, a meal, and resources like Brooke Shelby, who we found conducting a discussion about controlling your emotions. I've never seen this one get angry without doing something like that and walking away. The rare breed provides services, but it is not an emergency shelter. No one is allowed to stay here overnight, no matter what it's like outside. 
I can't imagine sleeping outside. I know sometimes in my house under a ton of blankets with the heat on, I'm still cold, so I can't, I don't understand what these kids have to go through, whether they be sleeping under a bridge or in an abandoned house or in the tunnel systems. The teams facing the elements on winter nights can get items here at the rare breed that might make the night a little warmer. We got some tarps, you know, for a lot of kids that sleep in the woods or down, you know, abandoned houses or anywhere they can crash. You get them tarps, uh, try to get them some sleeping bags, maybe some water containers. We also have, um, you know, other survival items we help with, like forks and knives and other things. Uh, we also have Life Skills Group that help them build shelters and help them kind of take care of themselves in an outside situation. But being a homeless teen is not just defined as someone on the street. You can be homeless, like 15-year-old Cassie, with no permanent home, just a place to crash with your uncle while your family tries to get back on its feet after losing pretty much everything. Homeless doesn't mean you don't have a house. Homeless is like you can, you have places to stay, but a home is somewhere where you feel safe, not just a friend's house. That's not a home to me. Being homeless is not having a place where you feel loved, wanted, and like needed. Erin Washburn closes the rare breed every Friday night and does her best not to take the job home with her. But that is not always easy. It's heartbreaking. You have to shut yourself off sometimes and know that if a youth wanted to go to shelter, you would have done everything you could to get them into shelter. But it's still on the weekends when you're sitting at home, but with your coffee by your fire, it's still in the back of your head. Where is this youth sleeping tonight? Are they sleeping outside? Are they warm? Are they gonna be there Monday so I can make sure that they're okay? Daniel Brewer is 23 now and no longer sleeps on the streets of Springfield. But that's exactly what he did at the age of 15. I used to live on top of rooftops downtown. I actually lived behind the bridge back here behind this rare breed. And I met my wife at the rare breed. His wife is Chelsea Massey, and she recalls meeting Daniel when they were both at the rare breed on a break from a group session. He walked up to me and he was like, do you have a cigarette? And I was like, sure. And he, has, he and I have the same tattoo on our hands. And he like slid his hand inside my hand and was like, look, we have the same tattoo. We've been together ever since. The couple just celebrated their second anniversary, but Chelsea remembers starting out with nothing and reaching her lowest point when she and Daniel barely scraped by. We had nowhere to sleep. And we stayed with his friends in this abandoned house on Commercial Street. And um, he would go out and make money however he could so we could eat. I'm glad that we're not there anymore like I really am. I would never want to be there anymore ever again because it just hurts to think that like that was me a long time ago because I have so much now and I've worked so hard. A few months ago, the couple that met at the rare breed during the darkest time of their lives found the best reason of all to smile after all they'd been through. This is Allison, Allison Kate Brewer. She is the product of the rare breed marriage. <laughs> She's the smartest, cutest baby ever. Chelsea and Daniel have gotten off the streets, and while Chelsea continues her education, Daniel actually works at the Rare Breed as a paid intern. Their story of overcoming can be repeated, according to Brittany Gosshorn. She saw it happen when she worked here at the Outreach Center. There have been some who have like graduated high school, which is a huge accomplishment for them. Some who are working on their GEDs. It really depends on the person, like if they're really willing to like work on it, you know, like work to get themselves out of the situation because you can have a lot of help but if you're not willing to do something for yourself you're not going to go very far because you're not committed to it. There are more numbers that can help us figure out who these homeless kids are. National studies show that almost 50 percent of them have been physically abused and about two in ten were sexually abused by family or household members. Half of the homeless teens on our nation's streets were asked to leave home by the very people who were supposed to protect them, their parents. The Connecting the Dots study showed that over 30% of the high-risk teens surveyed said being gay or lesbian contributed to them being on the street. In the face of those harsh realities, it's easy to see how earning a high school diploma or eventually getting into college seem like faraway dreams for our city's homeless youth. Can you imagine not having a shower, not having food, not feeling up to being in school that day, but yet they're there? And it was so much just to get there that day or they've been walking around all night long trying to stay um, safe and warm, but yet, and they're exhausted, 
but now they have to sit through school and try to get through school because that's the only place probably where they're going to get a meal that day. Patty Bridges at the Empowering Youth Program works with young people who need temporary shelter or support. Many have to be moved from dangerous situations and transitioned into more stable environments. She says the obstacles they face each day make it extremely hard for them to succeed. We told you earlier that Springfield is a relatively safe place to live, but Bridges says teens considering hitting the streets need to know what they're really facing. Living on the streets may seem like it's better than what the situation they're living in right now, but eventually they'll see that it's not safe. I know Springfield feels like safer than most places, but ultimately it's not safe to be out on the streets on your own. So you can call us. We will mediate anything. We will come to you. We will come to your home. We will come to school. We will t we'll come wherever you are. But don't walk out without knowing that you have a safe place to be. Safe or not, there are plenty of creative places homeless teens find to stay at night. Like this. Daniel Brewer and his friend Zane Parks showed us some of their old hangouts, starting underneath an overpass on Grant Street. You want a job, but sometimes you just want to go be homeless somewhere else. Yes. Like California. Going to California, that was like the dream for homeless people around here because yeah. it's always warm there. You never have to worry about it. Like here, there's climate changes. Our next stop was just down the street from the rare breed, another home for the homeless that Daniel and Zane visited more than a few times back in the day. The wintertime, that, that, this was like one of the best places that I could go because it's about a quarter mile back up in there. There's no wind at all. It's actually but, more warm. But then again, like, well, in the summer, it's always 10 degrees colder in there, yeah. so it feels pretty good. Then we checked out the gravel pit, which sits under this parking garage. We lay some cardboard down and then like a blanket, so there'd be like some like cushion from the rocks, you know, and um, then we just lay down and put the blanket over us and like say you have like clothes and a backpack, we usually use our backpack as a pillow. At another underpass the boys were familiar with, someone else had recently built a nest. I truly honestly do not know whose stuff that is, but you know, I might know them. I might see them later on tonight. Nearby, a used needle, but who knows what was in it. Anything from heroin to meth. They talked about how their days would include flying signs. Flying signs is you basically write uh, broke, need help, gas, money, whatever you can think of, any sort of lie or truth to make people stop and give you money. You can have like just a chick friend with you, a uh, pregnant girlfriend, need gas, stranded, anything. Anything that'll hit people's hearts. The last stop was a grim one, a hobo camp that even surprised Daniel when he saw how some people lived. I've actually never been back this far. I never knew this was back here. Zane and Daniel are in their early 20s now. As teenagers, they somehow managed to survive on the streets. But now that he's helping youth at the rare breed, Daniel has gained a new perspective about his homeless past. Some staff members asked me, like, so how, how's it feel being the other side of that line? And I didn't think about it till like, a week ago. And it's pretty sad. Now I, now I can see, like, how people thought, of, thought about me, you know, how people looked at me. Finding a safe place got a little easier three years ago when Springfield became one of 1,500 communities in the U.S. displaying those distinctive yellow and black signs, showing young people where they can go for protection. Local businesses and various public and private agencies are participating and acting as safe places for youth in trouble. But sometimes the trouble homeless teens get into is a result of breaking the law. Some of the kids we talked to admitted they had done it, but only as a last resort. Todd Duncan says people will do whatever it takes to survive, and teens are no exception. And, and that's been found in research that a lot of the crimes that, that homeless youth commit are crimes of survival to try to meet those basic needs. We, we have stolen food before. Um, most, majority of the time I, I, you know, I ask people for money, which I know is against the law too, but I ask them for money, uh, you know, tell a little white lie. Sometimes we'll even tell them the truth. We'll be like, well, I'm just trying to get a few bucks for a sandwich. Some people just look at us like, no. Living on the street as a teenager means coming into contact with homeless adults who may not have a lot of sympathy for your problems. Stuff gets stolen out there on the street. Someone will take your backpack and just walk off with it. There's regular people that you see every day that aren't homeless that pick on homeless people. It's bad. Like I've seen homeless kids get beat up for being homeless. I've sat out here many times on the square and I've been harassed, treated wrong, I've had stuff thrown at me out windows just because I'm sitting 
there. I'll be sitting there reading a book or something, and I'm homeless, so I'm scum of the earth, pretty much. Teens who are often hanging around the square do aggravate the merchants downtown. Everyone knows it, but no one would say it on camera. Liz Henson from the downtown Goodwill office did talk about the lack of sensitivity on the part of some merchants. To us, it's not necessarily neg negative. Um, to the rest of kind of the downtown area, uh, they may be a little bit ignorant to the needs of homelessness. On this show, we wanted to experience what it's like to be a homeless teen here in Springfield. So we asked Trey Edward, whom you met earlier, to help us out, and he agreed. We loaned him a small camera and had him shoot footage of his weekend. His commentary as he walked the streets, plus the visuals he recorded, give us a chance to walk in the shoes of a homeless person. It is 8 a.m. exactly on the dot, and this is Trey. It's a pretty cold day, so, I mean, it's going to be a rough one for us homeless people, but whatever, we're used to it more or less. The VA had all the cots full, and they don't allow you to sleep anywhere else in the building, so I'm going to the Midtown Library. Get on the computer, I guess. Not a whole lot to do on a Saturday morning. Oh, in case you guys are wondering what all the weird music is in the background, that's just my phone. I, I listen to music when I walk. And here's the good old Woodruff building. This last summer was like a sanctuary for all homeless people to go and camp. As you can see, wasn't very respected, lots of garbage. There's another place some homeless people used to stay. They ended up blocking it. It's kind of a big tease though. All that's blankets, sheets, pillows, couches, comfortable stuff, food, heat, all that stuff is just locked in there, just sitting there. Police just stopped letting us go in. Nothing ever happened here. We actually kept it quiet. You see that paper? That means you will spend at least a month in jail if you go in here. I cannot find anybody. That's really odd. I know like every homeless teen in the area, but they're all gone today. Here's Moda. This place is pretty okay. They'll do only one haircut a week for free for homeless people, but they do do amazing haircuts when they do it. So it's a cool place. Mud House was horribly empty. At least a homeless kid, it's all a bunch of college people. And they all gave me really gross looks as soon as I walked in, so I immediately walked back out. What's up? My name's Dakota. Yeah, Dakota's one of the homeless kids that roll around with me. We're walking down to Mickey D's, going Walk. to grab a bite to eat. Walking in the McDizzles. You know how that goes. Got some Red Bull with the food stamps. Right. I'm gonna be hyper as for 20 minutes. <laughs> I went to the gathering tree. They would not let me get my camera out there because it was after service and some people had warrants there. Usual stuff. After that, Tried to find the person that I lent my sleeping bag to this morning. He kind of fell off the face of the earth. Thank goodness I ran into one of the elder homeless people. He hooked me up. He gave me a Sub-Zero sleeping bag, which is much better than the one I had, actually. So I should actually be kind of warm this evening. Hopefully I get to my spot. I'm going to turn the camera off now so you guys don't exactly know where it is. I don't need anybody coming up to my spot randomly. I will attack you, no offense. Just out of my own safety and well-being. Well, my first spot was ruined. Somebody is near the area. They're not in my actual spot. I mean, I can't really claim it. But they're in the general vicinity, and that's just not safe enough for me. But yeah, now I'm passing Founders Park on Jefferson. Where I'm going? Ah, uh, no idea. All right, gotta find somewhere to chill for the night. My leg's getting exhausted. Local ordinances require the square to close down at 1.30 a.m. By then, if you don't have a place to sleep, you can be really vulnerable. Some teens find out the hard way. But we have several youth who, because they don't have a place to stay, will end up staying with someone and that next morning, that person will tell them, well, because I let you stay here, then you have to engage in, the, engage in sexual activity with me. Um, and they will en end up forcing them to do these things. Sometimes there may be older adults in the community that will uh, take in a youth to really prey on them uh, in one way or another and, and to use them. You know, it's really sad to see them having to use that as a means to, uh, to an end. But at the same point in time, that's the only thing sometimes that these people feel they have. And it isn't just about trading sex for a place to sleep. 
Jessica Fink has been on and off the streets since she was 13. She spent years at the mercy of family and friends in different towns until she found stability, thanks in large part to the Empowering Youth program. That was after years of homelessness. And it was just a vicious circle, and I was just getting tired of it because I was running, I was burning bridges, I was running out of resources, I was running out of help, and I was just getting fed up with the people who were trying to help me because it was always tit for tat. They couldn't just help me without me having to give something back. There are places in town where you can find shelter if you're homeless, but one big chunk of the city's homeless population has very few options when it comes to shelter on a cold night. The number of homeless males in this community has increased and the number of programs available to them has not increased. So there's a disparity between the two, leaving a lot of males ages 18 through 25 on the streets and in this cycle that they can't get out of because there's no beds available for them in any of those programs. So one of those 175 local churches decided to do something about it. A van from First Baptist heads to the rare breed five nights a week to pick up young males who have no place to sleep. The church is located just about a mile away, and for the last three months, volunteers have been providing a little bit of everything to those who have little. We have pool tables, ping pong tables, all the different recreation equipment, and the guys, as they come for the first two hours, they can just stand around and play, hang out, have a good time with that. We have a bowling alley. Several nights they'll get to bowl, and um, that's kind of a privilege we use for them. First Baptist provides a great place for the young men to let off some steam. It's nice. Get a few snacks, and most importantly, a good night's sleep when they're exhausted from a day on the street. There is no preaching, just a nightly prayer. The rare breed refers the participants to the church each night. As the program has grown, coordinator Brock Kennedy says he has learned a lot. My perception of homeless teenagers had this stereotype of what I see on a street corner or something, um, you know, as you're driving down the interstate. And my perception of that was just shattered as I started finding and, and meeting these guys. They, they are, um, a lot of them are going to school. Um, a lot of them have jobs. A lot of them are um, the exact opposite of that stereotype. First Baptist's efforts are certainly appreciated by people like Michael Jones. It's good, you know, that people care and there's somewhere where you can go and actually feel safe. Because Michael has not always felt safe. His life has led him down a few dark paths. He says he seriously considered methods of suicide more than once. Wrists, thinking about drinking bleach, guns running in front of a semi-truck. Nothing good. When it comes to suicidal, nothing's, nothing's good. good. Michael is taking classes at OTC, and he says being on the street has been a challenge, but he has found an upside. You find people you connect with out here. It's pretty cool. Connecting with people who are often totally unconnected. That's what Brock Kennedy and his volunteers are doing every night. I can truly say that we're doing what we are called to do as far as reaching where we're planted as a church. You know, it means a lot because you can see it actually has changed some of their lives. There is another shelter solution in Springfield. Through the rare breed, homeless teens can get on a waiting list to get into one of the 16 transitional living places in the building behind me. A few days after our interview with Dalton Locke, his number came up. And overnight, he went from being homeless to having his own apartment. And here's my room, but yeah, it's a mess. So, I haven't been able to get back into painting yet, but... There's two of mine, so. So how long are you going to be here? Until I uh, get a job and actually I'm able to get a place of my own or start MSU or Drury, so. Okay, and so you're on the job hunt right now? Yeah. <laughs> the rating on the flatness of the comic book is a six. Dalton's roommate, Andrew, is 18. He's been here two months and says it feels like a college dorm. He's also looking for a job with the help of another local agency, the Ark of the Ozarks. Um, I'm doing assessment thing with them to where like I go and volunteer different places to see what kind of job will fit me. For Dalton, coming here has meant a roof over his head and the comforts of home, even if it doesn't quite feel that way yet. You can call it home as soon as it get used to it, so. Andrew and Dalton were both hoping to find a job soon, but that is no easy task for the homeless. I mean, a lot of kids, they're looking for jobs, which is responsible, but people won't take them because they're homeless. And, and that's kind of the, just the, the cycle that they get in that's real hard to get out of. I mean, it's hard to make it to a job when you don't really have a way to get to the job in terms of transportation. Or you don't know where you'd be staying tonight. 
if you'll be able to get up on time to make it to work on time, or if you're going to be able to clean your clothes or take a shower or look presentable. So those are all things that, that really have to be solved before you know, successful employment can take place. One thing we learned during the preparation of this program is how many people here in the heartland have a heart for the homeless. So many volunteers and community groups are stepping up to assist, and you've met some of them during this show. They see things most of us don't, and hear things most of us never do, and they keep reaching out to make a difference in young lives. Their commitment to those less fortunate is obvious. Just a walk with the Lord all has gone to hell I see the vanishing they you passionate about the homeless youth? It breaks my heart to know that like the things that I had when I wasn't a teenager well they don't have you know like that family support and that support network around me like I graduated from high school I went to college like because I had people and they don't it's like they don't have anyone to be like you're special and you deserve to have a life that's not like having sex for money, like doing drugs to like take the edge off, like you can do better. And it's like they didn't have anyone to do that and I wanted to be that person so badly to support them and be like, you're awesome, you can do this. Like you have all the tools and that's what we were trying to do, like provide them with the life skills and the tools that they need to like build themselves up and to get out of the circle, you know, just of junk that they had gotten themselves into. And I think that's why I'm still like so passionate about youth, you know, in foster care and youth that are homeless because it's like they don't have that love that a lot of other kids have they have no one to give that to them. Thank you for joining us for HTV Magazine, Homeless in the Heartland. We have a special website devoted to more coverage of this topic. Please visit htvhomeless.weebly.com to see bonus footage and to find updates on some of the people you met during this program. You can also find reflections by some of our staff members. For our producer, Kaylee Pryor, Reporter Savannah Steffen and all of the HTV staff. I'm Kelsey Williams. We'll see you next time. Everyone is watching.